Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Atlantic Council Adrian Arch Latin America Center's annual event alongside the UN General Assembly. I'm Jason Marzak, Director of the Adrian Arch Latin America Center, joining you for one of the, one of the new Atlantic Council studios. I'd like to begin by thanking our partners for this event, Axios Latino and Telemundo. For those tuning in live, you can join the conversation on social media using the hashtag VAX, V-A-X, the number four, LAC. Now for the third straight year, alongside UNGA, we are using this moment to spotlight ways in which the global community can help Latin American and Caribbean countries face the most pressing issues facing the region and its future trajectory. Last year, we spotlighted the importance of a new era of economic cooperation to secure our shared future. And two years ago, in person, we focused on Venezuela and the global reverberations of a humanitarian crisis. This year, we will take the next hour and a half to again draw attention to the urgent issue of vaccination in Latin America and the Caribbean and the international partnership needed for economic recovery. And we will do so at the same time that President Biden is hosting a virtual closed door global COVID summit focused on raising the global level of commitment to end the COVID pandemic. When looking globally, Latin America and the Caribbean should be a top priority. Cumulatively, the region continues to be a global epicenter for COVID-19 with a total of 8% of the global population accounting for 21% of COVID cases and 30% of COVID deaths. Some countries in the region have made good progress on vaccination with Chile and Uruguay being among the top 10 countries globally for administering vaccines. But we can't let our guard down, especially as we, as we've seen resurgent waves in well-vaccinated countries and other parts of the world. As of late August, 18 countries in the region still have less than 20% of the population vaccinated. In this context, Latin American and Caribbean recovery is still fragile and uneven, and we need to do two things. One, we need immediate action. We need to continue to increase equitable vaccine access in and across the region. And two, we need to look beyond vaccination and plan ahead. We need to position the region for better recovery and growth. We need more productive, more resilient, more inclusive, greener trade and investments. And, Latin, and the Adrian Arch Latin America Center, we have been advancing both these ideas with our Vax for Lack campaign, our vaccine tracker, our biweekly COVID aviso, and numerous reports looking out to the future. And the international community can play an even more important role on both fronts. And we'll talk about how in today's event. Today, our first conversation on vaccination and health will feature the Vice President of Costa Rica, Epsi Campbell Barr, and the Minister of Health of Argentina, Carla Vesotti. It will be moderated by Axios Justice and Race Reporter and co-author of the Axios Latino newsletter, a must read, Russell Contreras. Afterward, our second conversation on economic recovery will feature Carlos Felipe Jaramillo, the Vice President of Latin America and Caribbean at the World Bank, and Annabel Gonzalez, Deputy Director General at the World Trade Organization, alongside Jose Varela, the Managing Director of 3M Mexico and Senior Vice President of Corporate Affairs and Governments for Latin America and the Caribbean of 3M. That conversation will be moderated by digital reporter at Telemundo Noticias and co-author of the Axios Latino newsletter, Marina Franco. And finally, I am delighted to be joined at the end to, with, by President Sebastián Piñera of Chile, who will engage in a closing conversation to be introduced by Adrian Arst, Vice Chair of the Atlantic Council and founder of the Adrian Arst Latin America Center. Now, let's turn to this brief video to introduce our first conversation. Vice President uh, Campbell Barr and Minister Vesotti, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, to start off, I'm going to um, ask uh, Madam Vice President Campbell Barr, Costa Rica has been a vocal advocate for universal and equitable access 
to COVID-19 vaccines and diagnostics through international collaboration. In partnership with the World Health Organization, Costa Rica has launched the COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, known as CTAP. And it's received endorsements from 50, from 45 countries, including 17 from Latin America. What are the latest developments of CTAP and why are initiatives like this so vital in the global fight against this pandemic? Thank you very much. As Costa Rica, we are made our word, but also the CTAP is supported by 45 countries, United Nations Agency, UNAIDS, UNDP, UNTAID, non-government governmental organization, South Center, Health Gap, and leading scientist Jacques Dubosset, Nobel Prize in Chemistry 2017, and Joseph Stiglitz, professor of Columbia University and Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Science 2001. The CTAP initiative has not advanced as expected particularly because large countries are their companies have not joined the initiative. There are two reasons for this. The first one is patent exclusivity rights negatively impact the supply and distribution of globally equitable innovative health technologies. Second, the know-how is keep secret by pharmaceutical laboratories another control and monopoly strategy. This initiative is vital for the global fight against the pandemic because it is built on values such as solidarity, international cooperation, and shared responsibility we seek to ensure that all people benefit at the same time, preventing countries with high resources from leaving other nation without access. Currently, one, only two in 10 people in the poorest countries have received at first dose of vaccines, while it's high and upper middle income countries, that number is eight in five people. In the case of Costa Rica, the people under four to 40 to 70, to, to 77, uh, 57, uh, pardon, have the the 82 percent have the first dose, doses. The 59 percent people to 40 to 76 have the 59.2 percent have the second doses. In the people under 58, the 92 percent have the first doses and the 90% have the doses. But if that is not the case for all the countries. The inequality on the issue of abstinence is tragic. It called a larger country to fulfill their commitment to provide vaccine to the poorest nations. Costa Rica will come to support the CABAX mechanism to fight the delivery of vaccine and CP, CTAP to democratize access to treatment and medicines. Also, we will promote the creation of a global fund pandemic economic recovery. It is so necessary as a country, as Costa Rica, to say that we need to do more internationally to the access of vaccines in, in, the, in the sense of the poor countries have access to their people because the pandemic is all over the world. It is insufficient if we feel that we can work only with the, with the, with the country who have more money and leave behind the countries that is the poorest countries in the world. Thank you. And Minister of Asalti, you recently attended the G20 Ministers Conference in Italy. There was a lot to discuss there. What were the main takeaways of this conference and how can G20 and other international actors continue to increase their COVID-related support for Argentina, Latin America, and the Caribbean? 
Hello, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor for me and for my country to participate in this uh, in this conference. And I have to say my agreement with the Costa Rica Vice President's statement and, and say hello to her too. Uh, yes, yet Argentina was present in the G20 meeting and uh, we really acknowledge that the, the G20 countries uh, uh, the fundamental role of defining the baseline place in order to understand the preparedness and response to public health emergencies uh, that are a, a public good, you know. The enforcement and preparedness and response capacities in a, a, at country level is also one of the targets of the SDG3 Health and Wellbeing approved, which was approved five years before the COVID-19 outbreak. Never before in the history had been perceived the need to ensure the universal and equitative access to life-saving critical supplies, technical knowledge, and necessary tools of the planet for the planet to cope with the pandemic. It is essential that C20 members support and further strength the World Health Organization's mandate as, it, as the coordinated international organization of the global health response including by not creating parallel structure, structures and waiting for the outputs uh, and recommendation of the, the working group to identify gaps where the C20 can best provide added value. It is extremely important that C20 countries support the worldwide distribution of vaccines approved by World Health Organization for emergency use and also for the uh, regulatory agency for each country and through the COVAX facility it is urgent to make it a reality, not only a wish or a project, or a, a, and the multilateral tools are an initiative such as the ACT accelerator and the COVAX facilities. Uh, also, the bilateral donations are critical to ensure universal and equitative access to, to vaccines. The, um, the reality is that the access of vaccine has not been equal, and, and we should work on that and keep trying to to be um, to 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 improve the the vaccine access to all the countries. These efforts are key to fulfill their mandates for the equitable allocation and distribution of diagnostic tests, treatments, and vaccines, so that the world can beat the pandemic. If if not, it would be very difficult for for the world to to move forward and, and leave the, the SARS-CoV-2 and the pandemic behind. In order to achieve the goal of sustainable, inclusive and resilient recovery, we strongly believe that all countries need to implement measures in line with the principles of international solidarity, collaboration, fairness, equity, especially for low and middle income countries to recover better. Thank you. And Madam Vice President, the uh, COVID pandemic has exposed and amplified the crisis of inequality in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, especially with women, indigenous populations, people from the African diaspora, uh, formal workers, migrants, and other marginalized groups. We can go on and on. You have dedicated your career to promoting greater equality, uh, diversity, and inclusion in your country. How has the pandemic and its social economic impact, like vaccine access and so forth, made you rethink the structural issues in our region and how can we do better? Thank you very much. The Costa Rican health system has tried to reach the entire population without making any distinction based on gender, ethnicity, or socioeconomic st status. Diagnosis tests are applied to all the population that requires them, according to national guidelines for care of, of the disease. And vaccination has been applied according to availability of doses, prioritizing according to risk groups. Specific strategies has been implemented for the identification and vaccination of some groups, such as street dealers, indigenous and immigrant population. About the migrant population, the impact of, on health is still very difficult measure since the records of care and services provided uh, to this population are deficient of their and their 
are many differences between countries. In the case of Costa Rica, La Caja Costarricense del Seguro Social, the institution who, who, do, who has the responsibility on health, does not register the migratory status of the person attended. So it is impossible to know how often and, and for what reason migrant asylum seekers, refugees, and people in a regular situation, among other request health service, or what their epidemiological profiles are. Another aspect to consider is the availability of vaccines. The possibility of vaccination migrant is in a, in a regular status is a necessary action in the fight against disease, but it also entails a high political cost as people continue to reproduce a series of stereotypes that hold migrants responsible for the loss of jobs, the transmission of disease, the increase in crime and saturation of service, which has already been disproved by the Caja Costarricense de Seguro Social and the Academy. We have to work in migration as one of the most important issues to deal with the pandemic. Considering this, it is essential to have data on the number of migrants and their epidemiological profile for the construction of public policy, not only in an emergency and in a pandemic, but also in the medium, medium and long term, so that it can be considered as part of the national budget and strategic action, such as vaccination. Think in the terms that Costa Rica have a very powerful health system, and we are dealing with the, with the, with the issues of vac vaccination. We have to think in the countries that don't have that kind of institution to deal with the pandemic and the vaccination. In addition, communication with the population who should be strengthened in all the countries so that the reason for migration, the human rights, it implies as well as the duties are generally known as tools to reduce stereotypes and politicization of migratory phenomenon even more so in the face of an electoral process. In this sense, a good practice that should be reinforced and amplified is to make them part of a discourse of the institution in press conference so that they feel part of the national strategy to fight against COVID-19. Finally, there is one aspect that the pandemic migration and the state of the economy has to help to bring in focus, not only for migrate, migrate people, but, but for all the people that is the issue of mental health and the relation with the pandemic. Attention to the state of mental health in migrant and all the population and the host community can improve both the acceptance of new neighborhoods and will and well as well as support the process of the community appropriation and the incorporation and of migrant into the labor and social sphere. We have we are dealing also to have a strategy in vac vaccination in indigenous community and the, the institution go there to for give there the right of vaccines. The experience of this pandemic has made us look to alternative way to locate the migrants, include them in vaccination guidance, as well as in a sanitary protocol for agricultural workers, saying some examples, but the work does not and it does not endure. 
it is a continuous process that must be reinforced in different institutions. And we as country could share our experience with other, other countries to know and to, and to have the better practice to have access to vaccines. Thank you very much. Minister Vazotti, in recent months, Argentina has seen an impressive success in suppressing the virus. It's, it's quite remarkable. Infections and deaths have been in steady decline since June, and we're now at a record low. Uh, Argentina has sufficient vaccines to cover about 69% of its population through current agreements, and 50% of Argentina's 18-plus population has successfully completed COVID-19 vaccines. What key factors contributed to the success and how can we get 100% including booster shots in the near future? Thank you very much. Yes, Argentina has a tradition of considering immunization as a social good and promotes vaccination at all stages of life. In Argentina, uh, population uh, really trusts vaccines and they demand the, the vaccines actively. Uh, we also uh, made progress regarding primary prevention through vaccines. We can mention the following achievements. Absence of liver transplant due to hepatitis A uh, since March 27, thanks to the innovative strategy of the single dose of vaccination. 88% decrease of the infant mortality due to pertussis less than one year after the implementation of pregnant women vaccination after the incorporation of Tdap uh, in this uh, stage of life, 50% uh, of decline of likely bacterial pneumonia in children after five years uh, after five years old, uh, uh, after two years of vaccination against pneumococcus. We also adopted a comprehensive approach, uh, putting the protection of people life first, designing specific measures to meet the needs and rights of women, adults, children, workers in, with low, low incomes and people with disabilities and vulnerable groups, not only regarding pandemic, but also uh, at the first line for, for the immunization program access. In Argentina, there was also an early implementation of health, social and economic measures that allowed us to strengthen healthcare systems, capacities, strength the national production of critical supplies, doubling the manufacturing capacity of me mechanical ventilators and recovering a, a part of textile industry. During the second wave of the pandemic, we implemented health measures in areas with the most epidemi epidemiological risk, which has decreased the speed and of increased cases and even the epidemic curve. And thanks to, to the implementation of the confined measures and progress of the vaccination campaign, uh, to date, we registered uh, 16 weeks of sustained reduction of cases and 14 weeks of reduction of hospitalizations and death. And we also uh, decrease, we, we saw also a decrease of over 90% of cases as compared with the peak during the second wave. We also uh, were successful in the contention of Delta variant. We don't have Delta variant predominant in, in Argentina, thanks uh, to measures, to borders measures, and also uh, the, the vaccination campaign. Uh, today, our country uh, has a, a very high vaccination percentage in the region, with 65% of the population uh, with one dose and nearly 45% of the population with complete schemes. And when we see the, the people over 50, this uh, full cycle vaccine vaccination is uh, over 80%. We have 83% of vaccine coverage with the, for people over, over 15. And uh, we also are part of the production. We are scaling up our national manufacturing capacity to take part of the vaccine supply chain that has been an, a strategic decision to promote access to vaccines for our population and all the, the region of Americas as well. We are part of the uh, chain production of AstraZeneca vaccine for Latin America with Mexico and also the um, Sputnik V vaccine uh, through the private, private uh, market. And we also 
are working to uh, keep receiving vaccines and include different stages of life. We need, we are receiving uh, from now to the end of the year, uh, 20 million doses of vaccines uh, from Pfizer to destinated to adolescents. And we are also working with Sign and Farm to uh, receive more information so our regulatory agency can recommend us to include uh, children from three to 11 years old. And that's the strategy to, to continue uh, uh, increasing the vaccine coverage uh, in order to reach 100% of the population. We are um, moving forward and working with the 24 provinces. Argentina is a federal country. Each of the provinces has the, the responsibility to implement the immunization programs and all the the vaccines are provided by the national government. So working from the national level to the pro with the provinces, the, the departments, the community, and all the healthcare workers and the, 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 the people in the vaccination centers, we are working very, very hard to, to reach the a high vaccination cover and to, um, to keep covering and protecting adolescent children and, of course, the high-risk uh, population. And but, Madam Vice President, I know you have to go, so thank you to join us. Please, uh, we're going to ask you to give some closing remarks and especially speak on um, President Carlos Alvarado, Alvarado's recent comments that we really need to consider the economic effect of the pandemic and possible more aid to various countries. Go ahead and, and tell us what is needed in Costa Rica. Thank you very much. In Costa Rica, the, the results and the impact of the, of the pandemic is very, very important, especially in women's, the un unemployment of women. And we have to think the recovery because um, the, the needs only of vaccines, but made a strategy to join the, the private and the public sector to, to make a, a very important activities and strategy for recovery in our countries. But also it is, it is one of the most important thing that the issue of recovery, we have to talk in terms, not only in the national level, but also in the international level. Thinking in the access of the vaccines, thinking in the access of financial um, of especially in in those groups that have the more impact more impacts and also to think what is the next step of the world in terms of development thinking in the in the health issues issues but also thinking in what we can do together to put the money the necessary money in those who are behind that's our work now. We are dealing with a very difficult situation in terms of, of economic issues, especially in, in the rural areas and also in the specific groups. But we, the, 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 my final message is it is to work together as um, a region and uh, not only to to deal with the, the, the vaccine access, but especially to work together in a, in a program for the recovery in, in our region. Thank you very much. And thank you, Madam Vice President, and thank you for your role and your historic presence in the region. Uh, I wanna go back to you, uh, Minister Vasotti. The um, Pan American Health Organization just made a major announcement about developing the mRNA uh, vaccine in the region, and Argentina has been selected as one of the countries. What is your reaction to this news, and how important is this to Argentina? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has shed light on the high dependence of Latin America and the Caribbean on imports of health technologies from outside the region and the vulnerability of the global supply chains. Argentina is truly honored in by yesterday's announcement by a Pan American Health Organization and World Health Organization after the launch of the regional platform to advance the manufacturing of COVID-19 vaccines in order to health technologies in the America in August 2021. 
our country remains committed and renews its effort to improve local production capacities in the region and to facilitate the expansion of the vaccine and, and other health technologies, research, development and manufacturing. The Argentine company uh, Synergium Biotech has been selected together with Bioman Biomanguinos, the Institute from Brazil, among several Latin American scientific institutions as Center for Development and Manufacturing of um, mRNA vaccines in the region of America. Synergium has a wide experience in manufacturing vaccines and other biological products. It also has a huge capacity for the development of complex health products together with the experience in distributing these products at the national and international level, including highly competitive, including highly competitive countries. Synergium has also shown its commitment to product supply through the PAHOS uh, procurement systems. Argentina has also a pharmaceutical industry very well known for its tracks record and high quality standards with 190 manufacturing plants out of which 160 are founded by national capital. In addition, our country has over 40 plants of state manufactured medicines and has a level four national regulatory agency according to World Health Organization rating. Uh, thanks of the, to technology transfer uh, from foreign laboratories, Argentina current uh, produced the flu vaccine, the pneumococcal vaccines, the, the 13 valent pneumococcal vaccines, and the tetravalent HPV vaccine. And moreover, as I said previously, uh, through international cooperation and solidarity, we have joined our efforts and technology capacity with Mexico to propose uh, of manufacturing AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine and with the Russian Federation to package the active ingredient of Sputnik V vaccine through Richmond Laboratories. We also uh, are sure that ensuring equitable access to medicines, vaccines must be a priority for all states as it is an essential condition to promote the effective enjoyment of the right of health for all. And in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's also a key pillar in not only to save life, but also to foster a more rapid and fair socioeconomic recovery for the benefit of all the people. In this context, over 70% of the vaccine has been administered in a small group of countries, whereas several countries have not been able to commerce to commence their massive vaccination campaign yet. And in America, only 20% of the population has been completely vaccinated. In many countries, this percentage is even lower. Our region has also required essential capacity to extend uh, regional manufacturing to reduce gap in vaccine access and well as, as well as other strategic supplies that our countries uh, lack. The platform, the platform created by PACO is a great opportunity to extend our regional capacity and to be able to tackle the serious shortage of COVID-19 vaccines in our region. We are convinced that together with PACO and whose technical support and the international community of experts, we will break this dependency cycle in our region and within a global vaccine market, which is highly concentrated. We are committed to contribute to the value of chain and supply of reagents of the sustain, sustainable manufacturing for, of COVID-19 and other mRNA vaccines in America. As Clarissa said, Clarissa Etienne has expressed during PACO's directing council, it is time when we need, it is the time when we need to accelerate our self-sufficiency by mobilize, mobilizing multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholders participation. The region of America must never, never experience the dependency that it experienced with 19, COVID-19. We must all together say never again. We are sure that this is the, the right way. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. And thank you to Madam Vice President. We appreciate your time in having this discussion. It's very clear that this virus, like birds, do not recognize borders, regions, or class distinctions. And it's something that we must remember it needs to be tackled, something that President Kennedy said back in the 1960s when he started the Alliance for, uh, for Progress. Our history in Latin America is connected to all the Americas, including the United States. And now to my compañera, um, Maria Franco from Telemundo and the co-author for Axios Latino as we move to our next panel. But first, here's a short video.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Russ, and our previous panelists and everyone who is tuned in. We are now moving a little bit, the conversation a bit forward. Uh, here, we are glad to be joined by uh, Felipe Caramillo, who is Vice President for Latin America at, and the Caribbean at the World Bank, by Jose Varela, who is the Regional Director of 3M, as well as the Director of 3M Mexico, and by uh, Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization, Anabel Gonzalez. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. So as made clear in the previous panel, uh, vaccines uh, being more accessible and more available across the region is key uh, to the region's recovery. But of course, there are so many factors uh, beyond that, especially in a region that since before the pandemic had very high levels of um, labor informality, of socioeconomic and gender inequalities, and of corruption. Uh, so in that regard, um, Vice President Caramillo, uh, if I could ask you first, given that you've written about how recovery uh, in economic and terms and beyond can be a pathway to a better future, um, what do you consider the World Bank's outlook and your personal outlook for the region right now And what do you think are the biggest areas of opportunity and maybe the biggest red flags as well? Thank you very much. And thank you to the Atlantic Council for this invitation. Um, so let me um, just set the stage by saying that um, I think the outlook has changed for the most part for the better. Um, you know, we've been evaluating the situation uh, week by week. And I think last time I had a chance to speak um, uh, with the Atlantic Council, I was a bit more pessimistic, but I have to say there's, there's good news. Uh, if, even though you know, we, the, there's this issue of uh, uh, equality in the access of vaccines is still an important issue. We do see um, an acceleration in the vaccination rates across Latin America and the Caribbean, especially in the last two months. It's very clear that shipments are arriving, more vaccines are available, more countries are vaccinating, and, uh, and this is very good news. I think on average, uh, we have um, about 50% of the population in Latin America having received one dose. Uh, and this is, this is very good news because it gives people the confidence to go out, the economies can start, jobs can come back. So this, this is very good. The other thing that has been very positive is uh, commodity um, uh, prices have been uh, higher these days, especially for the metals and uh, minerals. It really ha has helped a number of Latin American countries that are significant exporters. And also international finance has remained for the most part open um, and in interest costs have remained quite manageable. On the concern side, uh, maybe just to mention the two concerns is um, inflation in the rich countries has been going up uh, a bit. And so this might trigger some uh, increase in the financing costs in international interest rates. Um, and uh, this would add an extra cost to many Latin American economies at a time when public debt has increased uh, and also private debt and much of it in dollar terms. And then finally, um, my biggest uh, concern has been that, uh, you know, this is a, a big opportunity, this situation we're in, to take action to make needed changes so that the economies can be built better and growth can go, you know, pick up quickly and more inclusive. And uh, I've been saying that Latin America and the Caribbean needs to rethink the future and to adopt Uh, changes and reforms that will fuel a strong recovery, you know, a jobs recovery, also a greener recovery. But I worry sometimes that polarization in the region is, is a problem. So I really urge all countries to continue to work to create the needed consensus so that the countries can truly rebuild better. Thank you so much, uh, Vice President. You mentioned commodity prices, and of course, trade is going to be a big factor going forward for the region, uh, especially after the setbacks last year uh, in exports, especially, which are key to many of the region's economies. 
Uh, so I would like to turn to uh, Deputy Director General uh, Gonzalez. Thank you so much for joining us. And what is the current uh, WTO uh, forecast for the region, given that there has been a slight uptick, but of course there was so much contraction last year. And in what ways do you think that uh, the trades uh, transformational potential can be used in the region so that when uh, recovery starts going forward, we get to a better place as Vice President Caramillo said. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Marina, and thanks to the Atlantic Council for uh, this invitation. Uh, the WTO, we will be updating its uh, trade forecast in the coming days. But our April forecast uh, indicates that trade will continue uh, to rebound this year uh, with the volume of merchandise trade growing by 8% um, in uh, 2021 after falling by 5.3% uh, in uh, 2020. Now there is, um, we see uh, a significant divergence between regions with faster and, uh, and slower uh, uh, trade growth. Uh, and um, in the case of, uh, of uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, excluding Mexico, along with Africa and a few other regions, uh, we saw a decline in the volume of merchandise exports uh, between the first quarter of 2019 and the first quarter of 2021. Now that is beginning to change, as uh, Felipe was saying, driven in part by, in part by increases in, uh, in uh, commodity prices. Now. Trade will be, uh, in my view, critically important to power the region's economic recovery. And I want to mention three areas of WTO work that are particularly important to help revitalize Latin American trade. Uh, and work in each of these uh, three areas is intensifying ahead of our very important WTO uh, 12 Ministerial Conference in December. And these uh, three areas are the following. First, digital trade. Uh, electronic commerce and digitalization are rapidly transforming the way we trade, who trades, and what we trade. And this, of course, has been accelerated by the pandemic. At the WTO, over 80 members are negotiating an e-commerce pact to help harness the transformation. The participants have already found consensus on several negotiating texts, including on issues like spam, e-signatures, online consumer protection and others. Uh, but positions remain uh, apart on the more challenging topics of uh, custom duties uh, on electronic transmissions, data flows and, localized, uh, and localization and market access. So, and WTO members are also considering extending the practice of not imposing custom duties on electronic transmissions. And a number of Latin American countries are very active participants in these negotiations. Second, uh, services domestic regulation. A group of more than 60 WTO members, again, many Latin American countries, is working on new disciplines to ensure uh, that domestic regulation procedures for trade in services are clear, predictable, transparent, and not more trade uh, restricted than uh, necessary. And a result in this area would help countries foster the competitive services markets uh, needed to succeed in, uh, in tomorrow's economy. Uh, good progress has been uh, made uh, and uh, we see that in, um, in, in, in the advance of our uh, ministerial conference, uh, this is an area with, um, where we will probably uh, cross uh, the finish line. And last but not least, um, investment facilitation for development. In today's interconnected and digital world, in, uh, promoting investment has become synonymous with advancing trade and advancing development. Over 100 uh, countries uh, recognize this in the WTO context, and they are working on improving the transparency and predictability of investment measures and to streamline and speed up administrative procedures to deal with investment. Um, these negotiations are well advanced. Uh, again, a number of Latin American countries are very active, including uh, the chair of this negotiators, the uh, negotiators, the Chilean uh, ambassador, and, uh, and participants have already found consensus on several parts of the text. So these are three areas uh, where I think uh, good work is going on here at the WTO, uh, which can help support Latin America economic recovery. 
Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Director. Um, I would now like to turn to uh, Jose Varela. First of all, my apologies. I misspoke when introducing you. You are president of 3M Mexico and senior vice president of uh, 3M in Latin America. Apologies for that. Um, so, uh, Director Gonzalez mentioned, uh, for example, regarding e commerce and uh, how that can be honed in. Um, 3M and several of its products have become almost staples now in the COVID-19 era, which I am guessing came with a steep learning curve uh, for, uh, for supply chains across the world in a pandemic. So, uh, Ms. Varela, I would turn to you and say, what has uh, 3M and do you think companies like it learned uh, that can be used now across the world or in the region, including, for example, e-commerce? Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Marina and the Atlantic Council for the opportunity. As you mentioned, right, uh, 3M is a leader in the production of N95 respirators uh, around the world. Very important uh, product uh, to fight the pandemic. And at the beginning, uh, for sure, we have a, a lot of pressures uh, uh, in our uh, supply chain, right? Uh, but the company was able to react, uh, I would say, very quick and through additional productivity investments, and partnerships, including partnership of our suppliers and governments, were able to multiply by four our production during the critical times of the pandemic, right? And we were able to supply uh, the best protections to doctor, uh, nurses, and first responders. Uh, you ask about a uh, lesson learned about the digital economy. You know, uh, at the beginning, uh, and let me start with the lesson learned. At the beginning, governments and uh, society's reaction, and that was natural, was to, cl to close down uh, economic activities as, uh, as much as possible, right? What we find, found out, uh, I would say that two very important issues. Uh, number one, that uh, supply chains are integrated around the world, right? Uh, one country needs uh, another. And uh, different countries uh, were, class were classifying essential industries differently. Right. So for one country uh, was not aligned with the, with the other. That created some issues. So for, for the future, right, we need to uh, align this, especially in countries that, ha that have a free trade agreement as the one that we have in, uh, in North America. Right. Uh, and also, you know, uh, we discovered that most of the products uh, uh, are kind uh, like of essential. Why? Right. Uh, you know, pharma, we agree. Pharma is essential. We agree. Uh, medical products uh, are essentials. But you need adhesives, uh, you need uh, microchips, uh, uh, you need packaging supply. So all of these in, in those industries also uh, became uh, essential. So the lesson learned uh, is that uh, better than trying to slow down or close uh, some manufacturing and service activities that are very important, you need to uh, put your efforts in protecting the people in transportation, protecting the people uh, where they are in the factories or in the retail stores, right? Uh, because there were uh, ways to protect them and allow, you know, certain uh, level of normality in the economic activities. And uh, also we were very blessed, and I am always uh, think what would have happened if this uh, COVID uh, a, a pandemic was, uh, it would have been in the 1980s or in the 1990s. Right now, the internet, right, uh, all the digital commerce, it really helped us, and the people and the societies adapted very quick. Right, overnight we were working from home. Overnight we were asking or ordering most of our uh, key products uh, by internet. So I think uh, also that that helped. Uh, and and what the the we accelerate that, and we need to keep that gains uh, in everything that we learned uh, in the virtuality during the pandemic. Looking forward, right? That, that's that's uh, important. I think uh, we need to put more emphasis in near shoring. Don't get me wrong. Global commerce, globalization is still very important. We support that. But I think there is an opportunity in near uh, shoring where customers and suppliers are closer uh, as much as possible. A more, more regional integration, especially that's an opportunity for Latin America. Uh, and the US and Canada. We see Europe very integrated. We see Asia very integrated. Uh, we don't see uh, Latin America uh, very integrated, especially among ourselves and with the US. That's an opportunity uh, to put more investments in our region, our supply uh, chains uh, to be closer. And you know, that uh, number one uh, will protect us again, uh, against a future pandemic, but also will foster 
uh, and promote and, and, and increase the economic uh, activity, right? And last, uh, we need to be united on this. It's not just the government, it's not just the private uh, companies, it's all of us together. Indeed, thank you uh, so much, Mr. Varela. Uh, as, as you mentioned, integration uh, is, is key and that will require investments. So um, on that note, Latin America and the Caribbean was the region with the most pronounced drop in foreign direct investment last year. So first I would like to turn um, to Vice President Jaramillo and ask, what can the, the region's governments, uh, even those that have a slight populist tilt, do in order to bring those investors back and bring new investors in as well? Thank you, Marina. Um, yes, you're right. It is not easy to lure investors in the midst of a pandemic and a big economic crisis. But I think we have some big opportunities coming up in Latin America and the Caribbean and the countries that best position themselves could come up big winners in attracting new investments that will bring new technology, they will bring good jobs and dynamism to the economies. This is much, much needed. Um, some people see this uh, glass half empty, but I would bring up three quick points that make me um, optimistic in our region. The first is that uh, on the bright side, what over the last year and a half since the pandemic started, we have seen a surge in some sectors of the economy that are high productivity, especially the ICT, some sectors of finance and logistics. Why? We know why, because the pandemic has required much greater reliance on electronic platforms to work, to trade, to communicate. And, and Latin America now enjoys at least a dozen unicorn companies uh, in this region. Even in Argentina that had a massive uh, you know, shrinking of uh, the GDP by like $60 billion, there are unicorns whose value there have increased by over $60 billion. So I think there is a big future in new companies in Latin America. Second, related to this, and I think mentioned both by Annabel and by Jose, is digital. The di there is an ongoing digital revolution in our region, and it is moving a lot faster because of the pandemic. See, and since only about half of the population in Latin America has access to the internet, there is a huge business opportunity for those interested in this growing market. And this is at a time when governments have realized the importance of connecting people to digital tools, and they are willing now to um, pay for some of the cost of uh, the last mile of incorporating the poor urban and poor rural populations into this ongoing re re revolution. And third and last, um, I, uh, is the point that uh, Jose made is uh, I think many companies are looking for places to invest closer to the U.S. and to the large markets of the region. And this is what some people call this nearshoring. And many countries in Latin America and the Caribbean are well positioned to take advantage of this opportunity. This is particularly true of the countries that have deep trade agreements with the US, the Mexico, Central America, the Pacific Alliance countries, and even more for those countries that have been improving the investment climate and investing in better infrastructure for trade. So I am very hopeful that now that countries are on the recovery bandwagon, we will be able to see more investment picking up. Thank you, Vice President Gramillo. And uh, Deputy Director Gonzalez, jumping off from that, uh, does the WTO have identified any specific examples from around the world that you think would be applicable and adaptable to Latin America and the Caribbean to attract those investments? Well, let me maybe build on the points that were being made both by uh, Jose and uh, Felipe. And I think that there are, that basically to say that I think there are three areas uh, where Latin America could set an example in uh, redirecting the recovery in a more dynamic, uh, sustainable, and inclusive uh, direction. And, uh, and, and of course, this will require governments 
uh, to adopt some of those uh, reforms uh, that, uh, that were being mentioned. Um, but the, the first area, and I think uh, Felipe made a very clear point that, you know, a digital revolution is taking place. Um, and as in, other parts of, as in other parts of the world, the, the one silver lining of the pandemic we know uh, is the massive growth in uh, digital trade transactions and the number of people buying online. Uh, governments in Latin America could continue to build on this momentum to accelerate the digital transformation of their economies by tackling longstanding barriers to the adoption of this type of technologies, improving regulatory frameworks, and bridge, bridging digital divides. Uh, long-term and inclusive e-commerce strategies developed in collaboration between public and private sectors and underpinned by trade agreements uh, bring certainty and predictability to cross-border transactions and can therefore make a key contribution to the uh, recovery. I think another very important area of uh, focus uh, should be uh, infrastructure. Uh, McKinsey estimates that middle-income countries in Latin America could add two percentage points to annual growth rates if their infrastructure was comparable with that of other middle-income nations such as Turkey and uh, Bulgaria. And of course, the, uh, the World Bank is, is very much involved in this. But for this to happen, a combination of best practices in the use of existing infrastructure as well as private sector investment is critical. And many countries will have to revise you know, their legal frameworks on uh, public-private partnerships and institutional frameworks to manage uh, concessions. Um, and this well-designed and effective infrastructure plans must go hand in hand with the liberalization of transport services and improved trade facilitation and logistics plan, uh, an area in particular trade facilitation where uh, the WTO um, has been making a strong uh, contribution uh, on um, uh, expediting cross-border movements of goods in the region. Last but not least, one area that I'd like to highlight is environmental sustainability. Uh, the recovery from the pandemic provides an opportunity to strengthen incentives for business and consumers uh, in the region to shift to uh, greener and more sustainable production and consumption. And this is essential to build back better, uh, stronger, and, 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 and overall more, more you know, greener. So governments will need to put in place policy frameworks that capture the synergies uh, that exist between green investment, green trade, and, uh, and green jobs. Um, and a number of countries are moving already in this uh, area. For instance, uh, countries like Chile or Ecuador uh, establishing circular economy uh, frameworks that boost efficiency, minimize waste generation, help create new opportunities for trade in, uh, in um, reverse supply chain sectors such as remanufacturing and recycling. Other countries like Costa Rica, for example, being pioneers in adopting ambitious policies to halt and reverse biodiversity laws and value natural capital, uh, an area um, uh, more broadly here in the WTO, where we are thinking, how can countries continue to leverage tool as a power of uh, trade, as a powerful tool uh, to support uh, the transition uh, towards um, uh, zero net emissions uh, economy. So uh, I see from, from my work here at the WTO, uh, important opportunities in, in Latin America in terms of uh, the digital economy, infrastructure, both uh, physical and digital infrastructure as well, and environmental sustainability. Thank you so much, Deputy Director. And on the other side of the private sector, uh, Mr. Varela, given what uh, Deputy Director Gonzalez just said, about possible regulatory changes, infrastructure changes, and obviously bridging the digital divide and sustainability. Um, as a representative of the private sector, what do you think 3M and companies like 3M will now be looking for uh, in order to decide where to make investments uh, post COVID-19? Okay, uh, thank you, Marina. We see this uh, basically in two angles, right? As, as we said, we're optimistic about the future of Latin America and the Americas. And uh, as uh, Carlos and Adal said, nearshoring hopefully will start uh, to happen, right? And once uh, a nearshoring uh, happens, this is a good opportunity for companies like 3M uh, uh, to invest more in the region. And we have proven this strategy for many years. Uh, our strategy, strategy has been Europe for Europe, uh, Asia for Asia, Americas uh, for America. So it's proven. So 
Uh, once uh, we're seeing uh, more investments uh, from other companies, uh, we are for sure going to uh, uh, trigger additional ones. But what the second angle, what we need to uh, have uh, more investments. Number one, uh, I think this alliance between the private sector and the public sector it's a need. And I will tell you uh, some good examples that we are seeing. Number two, for sure, and, and we have uh, discussed this uh, many times, right? We need stability, political, economical, we need uh, rule of law, we need a partnership between uh, governments and private, co uh, and private companies, as I said, especially to focus in the key uh, supply chains or services that uh, our region uh, can be can have a competitive advantages. And, and as, as I was talking about uh, good uh, examples, we see with very good eyes uh, the high economic dialogue that has been started between the U.S. and Mexico, it started at the CEO dialogue. And, you know, and this is a, a forum where we have the private companies, both in the United States through the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and in Mexico through the Consejo Coordinador Empresarial, plus the government of Mexico and the government of, uh, of uh, the United States at very high level. And, and there are uh, happening very important conversations, how to focus in very in, in important industries like automotive electrification, medical device, rare earth. And I'm not just talking about uh, manufacturing, there are services for sure, but also about R&D. How can we also increase uh, through our good universities that we have in, in Latin America, our raw materials, our expertise, how can we increase uh, also the research uh, and development? And to foster the, uh, as uh, uh, Carlos and Annabel said, the free trade agreements that we already have. And um, uh, my, my last point that, that is very important, uh, ask the companies what they need. 3M uh, has the big honor to uh, co-chair the investment committee uh, in the CEO dialogue. And we have interviews. We have interviewed more than 80 CEOs, both in Mexico and and, uh, and the United States, asking what do they need. And you know, and the the mood is positive. I would say we see a recovery coming to to Latin America. Uh, it's not just Mexico. They are talking about Central America and for sure Latin America as a whole. The mood is positive. Rule of law, but especially to have forums to have discussions how to solve problems. There is a, a, a big interest to foster economic recovery, to do near shoring, to do ally shoring. And I think we just need to talk and execute. Thank you. Yes, for sure. Um, and especially with the focus on sustainability, uh, Deputy Director Gonzalez uh, gave some examples, but I'm wondering, uh, Vice President Caramillo, uh, is there something that you and the World Bank have seen uh, examples, whether they be very local or uh, points of interest across Latin America and the Caribbean countries that you think other regions should actually look to in order to um, uh, advance in their own recoveries? Thank you, Marina. Um, many things, because our region is a diverse region where at the local and, and regional and subnational uh, and national level, the interesting things are happening. I could mention many things, but you know, the, I, I will only bring up one now that I've been personally uh, very impressed with, um, which gets to this issue of the vaccines. You know, getting the vaccines has been difficult. But, uh, but the vaccines are finally arriving. But it turns out that in some countries, uh, they were not ready for um, the distribution of the vaccines and actually getting shots in the arms of people. I have been um, extremely impressed with one particular case, and that is the case of Ecuador. Um, you know, the, uh, President Lasso just started about three months ago, and he announced that he was going to undertake a logistical uh, a deployment of uh, all of Ecuador society, including the private sector uh, in, in very creative and innovative ways. And, the, and he promised that in the first 100 days, he was going to get vaccines in at minimum 50% of the population. That's about 20 million people. And he has met his target just in the last few days. So. Um, I think Latin America can show the way with these kinds of creative uh, uh, efforts and, in, and strong leadership 
that we can we can set the pace now ecuador has the highest rate of vaccination in a short period of time um it, it really uh is uh, heartwarming and i think we will continue to support countries that are willing to think out of the box and do these unusual things and set a global example of course and then as mentioned in the previous panel there's also the example of mexico and argentina uh, having the AstraZeneca vaccine right here to export throughout the Americas, right? Um, right now, I would uh, just like uh, Deputy Director Gonzalez and Vice President Camillo, and of course, Mr. Varela, if you have any closing uh, remarks jumping off uh, towards this recovery that will hopefully be more equitable, more sustainable, and more inclusive. So let me just uh, maybe add to this point that was being made by uh, Felipe about vaccination efforts uh, in uh, in the region that are that are so critical for the for the recovery because we know uh, that uh, you know for for the recovery to happen in Latin America but also across the world uh, we need to make sure that everyone can have access to a vaccine and here I want to highlight the important role of trade. In making this, um, in making this happen, uh, because uh, you know more international trade is critical uh, uh, in, uh, in in vaccine inputs. Uh, without access to vaccines uh, inputs, uh, the additional doses will not be produced. So we at the WTO, and in collaboration with the, with the World Bank, the IMF, the WHO, uh, have been working with uh, with the companies as well. Uh, to identify what are the critical inputs for manufacturing COVID-19 uh, vaccines. And this is very important for Latin America uh, because putting in place measures uh, that address the bottlenecks to both vaccines and vaccine inputs is absolutely critical uh, to, get access, uh, uh, to get access to this uh, vaccine. So some of the measures that we have seen in the region, and I think that are very um, uh, important, are uh, measures to uh, identify and reduce uh, export restrictions or put in place trade facilitation measures, uh, fostering cooperation and partnerships, including through voluntary licensing and technology uh, transfer, uh, monitoring trade policies to ensure uh, transparency, uh, building the capacity of the regulatory authorities uh, to make sure uh, that um, they, uh, they, they, they can rapidly move uh, towards uh, guaranteeing the safety, the quality, and efficacy of uh, vaccines, and more broadly, other medical uh, products, uh, and and then begin a process of producing uh, better uh, better data uh, to understand um, how is it that supply chains are working in uh, in the region. So, so I see positive developments in this area as well. Uh, that I think you know could, could serve the basis for exchanges between uh, uh, the regions as well. Uh, to make sure that uh, that that 50% of uh, uh, vaccine uh, population already received uh, one uh, one doses uh, can grow uh, very rapidly uh, in uh, in the month ahead. Thank you, Marina. You know, as a closing comment, uh, COVID has been very painful uh, and hard for our societies, for our societies. But I think also COVID has made us uh, very uh, more human. And we think we need to take advantage of that. So, number one, you know, uh, as, as uh, uh, Carlos and Annabel said, uh, and also in the previous panel, let's try to vaccinate all of the people in Latin America as soon as possible. And we are very pleased uh, uh, with the with the progress that we are having. Uh, number two, as we are recovering, make sure that the 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 benefits of this economic recovery is for all. We need to incorporate everybody in this recovery, and and, and we are seeing very positive how many, uh, you know, most of the big companies and also medium sized and small companies are putting efforts in environmental, in social and governance. We cannot forget that. Uh, I can tell you uh, my company 3M, we have uh, very clear targets about carbon neutrality, uh, uh, helping the NGOs, volunteer hours, reduction of, uh, uh, in the use of water, etc. But uh, also all the companies have. So let's keep the conversation, environmental, social governance, it's very important. I, I just want to highlight that uh, it's not just the uh, own targets. We need the partnership with universities, with the societies, with trade associations to do uh, that. Uh, just want to, to share two examples that we are uh, promoting in Latin America. We're very 
uh, a, you know, deep in science to promote science. So we started a program called 25 Women uh, in Science in Latin America. And basically, we ask uh, women in Latin America that are in STEM, in science, uh, share with us your project. Uh, we're going to evaluate, and if it's a good project and has social positive social impact, we're going to give a lot of visibility. We received more than a thousand amazing uh, projects from women. Uh, we gave visibility to 25th, and that serving as an inspiration to other women uh, to promote science. And number two, uh, we uh, recently organized the uh, Sustainability Summit where we have an expert, uh, we have uh, uh, people that in TED Talks, we have uh, uh, many companies sharing their uh, ESG and sustainability uh, uh, best examples, best practices. And for sure, we have the governments uh, telling us what they need from the private sector. Even we had uh, Ministry of Environment of Chile, uh, Carolina Schmidt, uh, to, talking to our private companies, uh, very, very positive. So, you know, it's it's uh, a, let's keep a, many of the gains who are more humans uh, in the recovery is for all, promote ESG and the, not just internally, go and promote science, promote uh, a, a social justice and that this recovery recovery is for everybody. Thank you. Yes, of course. And uh, my, you mentioned microfinancing. I'm sure Vice President Jaramillo has some uh, wrapping up thoughts on that. Thank you, Marina. Uh, look, I'm just thrilled uh, particularly to hear both Anabel and Jose talk about the sustainability and, and climate. And so I'll, I'll just say a final word on that. I think in the area of, of climate, Latin America has a great opportunity to also set a global example. We know well that our region is not a big contributor to the problem, uh, the global problem of climate, but um, people in our region are deeply affected by climate change. We, we see more hurricanes in the Caribbean. We see these huge floods recently in Argentina. We see droughts in the Andes. So we know that climate affects poverty. We know, we project actually that people are being displaced. We are calculating that about half a million people per year could be displaced by climate impact over the next 30 years. So uh, the fantastic thing is that people are talking about it and in particular young people. When I speak with young people across the countries of Latin America, the environment, climate, the quality of air, taking care of the Amazon, taking care of biodiversity, something they have top of their mind, use of more renewable uh, energies. So I think that Latin America is poised to have a greener recovery, and, and I think it will be thrilling to see this materialize. Let's, let's certainly hope so, and we will all work towards that. Uh, thank you so much again to all of the panelists and to everyone who is tuned in. Um, as we move uh, towards the keynote, uh, please enjoy this short video and some words uh, from Ms. Adrian Arst, um, who is the Executive Vice Chair of the Atlantic Council's Board of Directors and founder of the Adrian Arst Latin America Center and the Adrian Arst Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. Thank you so much again. Adrian Arsht. I am the Executive Vice Chair of the Atlantic Council and founder of the Adrian Arsht Latin America Center and the Adrian Arsht Rockefeller Center Foundation on Resilience. I'm delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, the President of Chile, Sebastián Piñera. Mr. President, welcome back to the Atlantic Council, this time virtually, for a conversation on Latin America 
and the Caribbean's post-COVID recovery. And may I say a happy belated Independence Day. I hope you had a wonderful time celebrating Las Fiesta Patrias this <laughs> past weekend. I said welcome back on purpose. As you may remember two years ago, I had the opportunity to be with you in person when you were honored at the 10th annual Atlantic Council Global Citizens Award in New York City. The award recognized Chile's groundbreaking leadership in addressing climate change and your pragmatic approaches to policy and economic revitalization during a period of outsized regional uncertainty. In your acceptance speech, I recall you relaying the following message. Quote, difficulties and divisions cannot prevent us from acting together to face the formidable threats to mankind that we will have to face. The same message holds true today as the region and the world face the challenges and uncertainty posed by COVID-19. President Pinera, as we look at your presidential term, an item that stands out is making Chile a global vaccination champion with 77% of your country's population vaccinated with at least one dose. Your country boasts the highest vaccination rates in the region alongside Uruguay and indeed one of the highest in the world. Mr. President, we look forward to your insights on confronting COVID-19 and we are delighted to have you join us for this keynote conversation, albeit virtually. And now I will hand over the program to Jason Marzak, director of the Adrian Arst Latin America Center. Thank, thank you, Adrian and President Pineda. Welcome once again to the virtual this time Atlantic Council. I'd like to start by asking about Chile's trajectory during the pandemic and then ask afterwards about regional and global COVID support now and looking ahead. But to begin, your country has boasted some of the world's fastest vaccination rates, as Adrian mentioned, being called the vaccination champion. As you noted yesterday in your speech before the UN General Assembly, early negotiations with vaccine producers were instrumental as we're drawing on some of the lessons of past vaccination programs. So that today, as the world heard you say, almost 90% of the target population is vaccinated in Chile, and you're also vaccinating children at the same time. So to begin, Mr. President, as we continue to push for greater vaccination assistance in the hemisphere, what is the secret to Chile's vaccination? Well, first of all, agents, thank you very much for your kind words. Thank you, Jason, for this opportunity. Well, we knew about this uh, pandemic, which was uh, December 31st, 2019. We realized that we had to do two things. And in a very fast and committed way. First of all, to strengthen our health system, to be able to provide the medical services that the patient would going to require. And the second was to prepare ourselves to implement a very fast and, and massive vaccination process. For the first target, we integrated the private and public health system, and we fortify our capacity to provide services for the most a serious patients. Therefore, we multiply by three our UCI, our uh, treat, uh, critical treatment by buying ventilators. We did that in February. And in April, we decided to take a huge risk and go and buy and commit the vaccines. And therefore, we, we had conversation and evaluations and negotiation with many, many projects. At that time, there were no vaccines in the world. And we decided to make a strong commitment early in the year and uh, to guarantee that we will be able to access the, to the necessary vaccine to implement this massive and fast vaccination process. And we make deals with many very promising laboratories like uh, Oxford, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Sinovac in China, and Johnson and & Johnson. And therefore, we, we were able to take a risk because we had to commit resources in order to guarantee that we were going to receive the vaccine opportunity and at the same time at a fair price. And that was what happens. So we started vaccinating uh, our population in December last year. And by now we have already vaccinated with two doses, more than 90% of our objective population. And we are 
a, we have started with the third doses a, a month ago, and we have all, almost one third of our objective population already vaccinated with a third, a booster doses. And we have already started to vaccinate children from six to 11, and very soon we will vaccinate children from three to six years old. And that has a, provide us a protection because nobody can guarantee that we cannot avoid the virus from entering the country. The only thing that we can make sure is that we will be well prepared when that happens. And that's what we've done. Now that we have the, the trait of the Delta variant, we already have most of our population vaccinated with two doses and a good part of it with three doses. So we hope that we have done what was possible to do in order to not to uh, avoid the consequences of the pandemic, but at least to mitigate those consequences and protect the health and the lives of our people. So, President, as you're, uh, well, I think some of the keys to your success in Chile, taking risks and also having foresight uh, and planning a, planning ahead for that, that vaccination. As to, President, take, to take the threat very seriously from the beginning, to not only to worry, but to act. And we had a huge advantage because in Chile we have a very strong tradition in vaccination, massive vaccination process. And therefore, one thing is to have the vaccine and all the, the, the logistics that you need, temperature. The other thing is the capability to put those vaccines in the arms of the people. And in Chile we had a very strong, uh, a very strong system of uh, getting those vaccines out to the field, to the people. Therefore, to react, to take very seriously the, the threat, to not only to worry, but to act immediately, to take risks. And in those risks, we say, well, we are risking money, but we would, don't want to risk lives. That was our philosophy. Those are the key elements of why I think that Chile has done a good job in fighting this terrible pandemic. And as president, you've, you've managed now what will hopefully only be a once in a generation pandemic, although we can't, don't know the answer to that. But as COVID cases and deaths continuously have decreased over recent months, hopefully we're past the most challenging initial period of the pandemic. But now it's a matter of looking ahead to the new, new challenges, the new challenges of, frankly, living amid the pandemic. Uh, as you uh, pointed out, that the pandemic will continue to come across borders. Looking ahead, how has your experience in Chile combating the pandemic changed the way you think about your country's future? but also about the future of Latin America and the Caribbean in com combating such types of pandemics. Well, by the way, I think that this pandemic has uh, shown a big triumph of science, but also a big failure of politics. Because imagine that before it would take at least 10 years to, to produce a vaccine, an effective and secure vaccine. Now it was produced in less than 10 months. That was a huge success of science, and they were able to share information, to collaborate, to invest, to take risk. In politics, I think that we didn't react uh, with the necessary force and at, with the necessary urges. Imagine that the two superpowers, instead of collaborating during the pandemic, they have been confronting each other permanently. That's just one example of how I think that we don't have the kind of world or international infrastructure or architecture or institutions to fight more efficiently pandemic like the COVID-19. With respect to our challenge, I mean, life is, is a basket of threats and challenges and opportunities, and that will, will go with us forever. Now that I, I hope that the worst of the pandemic is behind us. It, now, nobody can guarantee that. I mean, nobody can guarantee that. So that's why we don't want to, to be ingenious or, or to be naive. And therefore, we are all the time preaching to our people that they have to, to, to keep and to protect their own uh, health by taking provision like using masks, social distance, uh, uh, the ventilation of closed uh, sites, and also, of course, prevent agglomerations. But now we are facing new challenges in the world and in Chile, in the world. We are facing a huge challenge with climate change. We are in a course of collision. Let's be very clear and frank. If you look at the last report of the international expert panel of the, nation, of the United Nations, what are they saying? They're saying that the situation is much more serious than what we thought. 
that the damage is moving faster than we thought, and the good part of that damage is already irreversible. If we don't do anything, we are heading towards a, a environmental a apocalypse. We are heading in a course of collisions. And, they, and we, well, we are the first generation that is suffering the effects of climate change, and we're the last one that can do something to prevent that apocalypse. And that's why yesterday we have a meeting with the, with the Prime Minister Johnson and, and many of the key leaders of the world, because we don't have enough resource now to guarantee that Glasgow, which will be the COP26, will be a success. The Paris Agreement are not being fulfilled. And even if they were fulfilled, they are not enough. And therefore, we have a lot of time to catch up in order to increase the ambitions of our national determined contributions. Many countries have, are not doing that. At the same time, we will have to be able to put a fund to finance the adaptation and mitigation efforts of less developed countries. And we are far from that, from that uh, goal. And that's why I think that we have a very few days in order to make sure that in Glasgow we will move forward and not backwards. So that's one challenge, climate change. But on, on top of that, after the pandemic, we need to recover our path towards development. The, the purpose of Chile is to become, within the next 10 years, to be able to defeat poverty, defeat underdevelopment, and become a developed country with, with, with freedom, democracy, right of law, or rule of law, and respect for human rights. That's our target, our goal. And for that, we need to re recover our growth capacity. Chile is a country that was growing at 5 6% per year on average for the last 30 years, and the pandemic has suffered as produce a huge impact in that capacity to grow. So now we need to recover our path towards a development, not any development. It has to be inclusive. It has to incorporate everybody. It has to be sustainable. It has to be respectful of, uh, of the environment. That's the only kind of development that is worth it. Mr. President, you, you mentioned the importance of the international community acting more cohesively, more collaboratively, both in combating COVID, as well as, of course, in collaborating in the, in the in the threats, uh, the very real threat of, uh, of climate change. Um, how could, in your perspective, what could be done differently? Uh, how could the international community uh, be better prepared uh, for the next major uh, uh, global threat that we face? Well, first of all, all our architecture, our international architecture, the world international organization, like the World Bank, the United Nations, the IMF, and many others, are not have not been designed to face the kind of challenges that we are facing now. Before, many problems could be solved at the national level. Now we see that the pandemic or the climate change cannot be resolved by any country. It has to be resolved with all the countries together. In the case of the pandemic, we have to realize that nobody will be 100% secure until everybody is reasonably secure. And we are, we are far away from that goal. We have so many countries that have not have not have access to, to vaccines. And in terms of climate change, of course, that we need to change the architecture. That's why we have proposed a new international treaty to face future pandemics and to strengthen the World Health Organization. And we think that we have to do something with the international architecture to face climate change, because now everything is voluntary. So we go there and every country can do whatever they want. They, they commit themselves but on, on a voluntary basis. That's not enough. It's not enough because the problem is too big and it's not enough because it's too urgent. So we need to change that. Given that that will take time, in the meantime, there are five countries or eight countries that are responsible for more than 80% of the greenhouse gases emissions. And they have to do a much better job. And we know, we all know who are those countries. For instance, I, I, is, is, I, I was very happy that the, the, U, the US has come back to the Paris Agreement. That's absolutely necessary. But we need more ambitious commitment on the part of the US, China, India, Japan, the European Union, they are doing a good job, uh, Brazil, and all the countries in the world. So I think that we don't have the time and the problem is too serious hmm, to just to rely on traditional methods of trying to convince people and acting by consensus on a voluntary basis. That is definitely not enough. And we have to realize that and that's something that we will discuss in Glasgow. Thank you. Very, very excellent points. I want to uh, ask you as well uh, about the region specifically. Uh, in addition to the global community, your perspectives on 
uh, especially with regard to future health threats? What could the region be doing to better prepare uh, for uh, these types of uh, trans-border health threats that we will probably continue to see, uh, especially with uh, the climate change? Well, in, in our region, Latin America, Latin America, let me tell you something, it's a continent blessed by God because we have everything. We have a very large territory with very vast and generous natural resources. We don't have the kind of, uh, we didn't destroy ourselves with world wars like Europe in, in last century. We don't have the kind of religious of ethnic conflict that have produced so many problems in so many parts of the world. So we have all the opportunities, but we haven't been able to take advantage of those opportunities. That's why I think that uh, Latin America is not a, an underdeveloped continent because of the will of God. It's because we haven't been able to take advantage of all the blessing that God put in our continent. What do we need to do? Many, many things. First of all, we have to increase dramatically the quality of education. Latin America is lagging behind in terms of quality of education with respect to, to countries at the same level of development. And that's a key aspect. We have to invest much more in science technology. We have to, we cannot be passed we cannot observe like we did observe the industrial revolution. We cannot have just an observatory position with respect to this new revolution, the technological digital revolution, the society of knowledge and information. But another area we have to move fast. Third, I think that we have to realize that Latin America has to be much more inclusive. We cannot have the kind of inequality that we have in Latin America because then we spend most of our time in a, a fight, a, a fratricide fight between ourselves instead of joining our forces to face these challenges. There you have education, inclusiveness, uh, more science and technology, and we need to have more stable political system. Right now you see that the demo democracies in, in Latin America are in a bad position. We, the, 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 the democratic spirit uh, is weaker now than what it was a, a few years or decades ago. We have the cases of Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba, but we also have many cases that people that go uh, 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 achieve power democratically, and then they want to perpetuate themselves in power. So they use democracy to destroy democracy. That's something which is happening in some countries in Latin America. So we have so many challenges. That's why we think that uh, once we have uh, we have a uh, overpass the worst part of the pandemic, we will have to concentrate on the endemic problems that Latin America faces. And that's why we haven't been able to accomplish what everybody wants, to have a free continent with a strong and stable democracy, with rule of law, with independence of power, with respect for human rights, and at the same time, with enough development and inclusiveness, in order that everybody is involved. In Latin America, you have people that live better than the richest people in, in the US, and other people that live poorest, than the poorest people in, in, in Africa. So we have too many inequalities and we have to reduce those inequalities in order to have a common project, a common mission. Well, Mr. President, you've laid out an important, very important vision for uh, where the region could go, the, the potential future for the region, and also key in, as you said, the blessings that we have across Latin America and the Caribbean, unlike frankly, any other region across the world. I wanna thank you, Mr. President, for uh, your time uh, and uh, your commitment to these incredibly important uh, issues today. Jason, thank you very much. And despite all the problems, the, the best is yet to come. Best is yet to come, exactly. Well, that's a great message to end on. I wanna thank you again, Mr. President. Today's event was organized to draw greater attention to the need for global support for Latin America and the Caribbean amid COVID. And there are a couple of key messages as, as you've laid out as well throughout the last hour and a half. The importance of continuing to push for vaccination drive in the region despite recent success. The importance of strengthening local production and capacity as a long-term solution to strengthen health ecosystems and the need for greater integration in doing so. But there's a real opportunity now, an opportunity to carve out, as you were mentioning, Mr. President, a better socioeconomic future which will require working across ideologies and ensuring that those who have traditionally been left behind use this as a moment to, to get ahead. And that re, re, reinforces the importance of inclusive growth uh, across societies as we're looking to the future. One, 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 one more point, Jason. Well, first of all, solidarity is very important. Even though vaccines have been very scarce, 
we have made our best effort to collaborate with other countries, donating vaccines to other countries in, in our continent that were in a more difficult situation. Another thing is that we, I would like to emphasize that really, uh, science has spoken loud and clear. And you can read the last report of the UN panel. Uh, so citizens are asking us, political leaders, to act. And they are, are asking us that as a moral imperative. Technology, give us the tools and the instrument to change the course of history. So now it's our responsibility to take the climate change threat seriously and to change the course of collision in which we are now, because otherwise hmm, nobody will forgive us. Somebody, our sons, our grandson will ask us, what did you did when you had the opportunity to change this collision course towards an apocalypse, an environmental apocalypse? And the last thing is that it's very incredible because a man or humanity is the most intelligent creature in the universe by far. At least we haven't discovered any, 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 anybody with more intelligence than humankind. At, at the same time, he's the only species able to commit collective suicide. And maybe we're doing exactly that. So let's use our, our intelligence to guarantee the survival of humankind in planet Earth, instead of using our intelligence to destroy it. Just, let's follow the science. Uh, the science is laid out for uh, uh, the need for uh, health recovery, climate change, and all the other critical issues facing, uh, facing humanity, as you, as you say. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. President. I wanna thank you again for joining us. Uh, thank the previous speakers, Vice President Campbell Barr, Minister Basote, the World Bank's Felipe yeah. WTO's Annabel Gonzalez, 3M's Jose Barella, and also again, our media partners at Axios Latino, Russell Contreras and Mariana Franco and the Adrian Arts Latin America Center team who put this event together. Stay tuned for our continued work. Uh, we are committed here at the Adrian Arts Latin America Center on carving out a better future for the region and raising the importance of vaccinations for the region and rethinking the region's future amid COVID. With that, thank you all very much for joining us. Mr. President, again, thank you for joining us and have a good rest of the day.